Good morning. So we're on our fourth Sunday of Lent, and the fourth Sunday of Lent is kind of the same as the third Sunday of Advent, kind of a Sunday of rejoicing, rejoicing that we're more than halfway through Lent, so hence the rose-colored vestments today at Mass. We're also on the fourth week of our message series called No Offense, and we've been looking at the various different types of offenses, that there's two types of offenses, really, those that are perceived and those that are real. Perceived, it's when it's just you being hurt, but no one intended to hurt your feelings. That's the kind that we should try to cope with on our own. It's a whole different deal when we have a right to feel offended because someone has wronged us. So how can we just let that go? We have a tendency to hold on to these offenses because we feel like we don't have any choice. If I let go, then somehow I'm justifying the offensive behavior and denying my own feelings. So instead, we just sit there and stew on it. The truth of the matter is that we do have a choice. There is a way forward. This action is actually the very core of Christianity. Every week in the creed, we profess to believe in it, but it's so much easier to say it than to actually do it. So to help us out, we're going to look briefly at St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire and a center of commerce located in what today is now Turkey. St. Paul spent three years living in Ephesus, developing its leaders and setting a firm foundation for the church community there. Subsequently, he wrote to them and underscoring basic principles of the gospel message. We can pick it up and, and read the letter to the Ephesians that it takes about half an hour to get through the entire letter, and I would encourage you to do so this week. But St. Paul, right before our reading picks up today, we hear, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. that it turns out, sin doesn't just hurt you, it can kill you. Sin is an experience of death. It kills the spirit and suffocates the soul. Sin kills relationships with others and with God. God's laws can't be broken. When we transgress God's laws, we don't break his laws. We break ourselves. Paul continues to describe our situation when he says, all of us lived gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. In other words, in doing whatever we want to do, we've also lived unmindful of God and his word. Think of how you would feel if you offered to do a favor for a friend for free. And then they had a party and didn't invite you. You would feel offended, would be incredibly offended. And that might lead you to anger. And that anger might take the form of retaliation or punishment. This is our reality before God. We've offended God. And God would be perfectly justified in responding to that offense by anger and wrath. In fact, he's often been portrayed in just that way. That's not what the Bible says, that St. Paul tells us exactly what God does with our offenses. 
God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he has for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. From anyone else, we would expect to pay back. But it's different with God. When we offended, God didn't pay us back. He brought us back. He brought us back to life. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from you. It's the gift from God. It's not from works, so none of us can boast. Sin brings a kind of death. Grace brings life. Sin is our choice. Grace is God's gift. Paul wants us to be very clear that we have nothing to do with getting into a right relationship with God. It's all God. The only thing God wants for us to do is to have an open heart to receive it. So when it comes to getting into heaven, God doesn't add up all the good things you did and how many times you came to church and then subtract all the bad things you did and all the Sundays you slept in instead. And if the good outweighs the bad, you're in. And if the bad outweighs the good, you get punished. That's not God. That's Santa Claus. There's other faiths that teach that we somehow earn our salvation by doing good works. That's not what we believe as Catholics. Certainly good works win God's favor and blessing and bring rewards. They're the fruits of our faith, but they don't bring salvation. Paul is clear. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, not by your works, so no one can boast. It is the gift of God. Payback for offenses is foolish and futile because it doesn't really work. There might be some immediate gratification in it for us, but long term, it hurts our hearts. The key to overcoming offense is to emulate God's own pattern in dealing with us. God didn't pay us back. He brought us back. You read from today's gospel in the Gospel of John, probably one of the best-known verses in the scriptures, <clears throat> so iconic because it sort of sums up everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For to ever really get over offenses, there's really only one way to do it. We need to forgive others as God has forgiven us. Now the pushback to offense is that if you forgive someone, you're saying what they did didn't matter. Of course it mattered. In the same way your offense mattered, and so God had something to do about it. Some people say, I can't forgive them because I can't trust them. These are actually two very different things. Forgiveness has nothing to do with trust. You can forgive someone and still not trust them. Maybe you push back and say that if I forgive them, they're going to get away with it. But is holding on to the offense really keeping them accountable? You're the one still carrying the burden of the offense. It's bothering you more than it bothers them. So who are you hurting? Forgiveness is not saying it didn't matter. It isn't about trust or even necessarily about rebuilding a relationship. It's not about holding someone accountable. 
Forgiveness is simply canceling a debt. That's all it is. At some point, businesses have to write off money they're never going to get and let it go. They decide that a customer that owes them money is never going to pay and it isn't worth the energy and resources to keep chasing after it. That's forgiveness. We cancel debts because that's the way God chose to deal with us. So how do you forgive someone a debt? You name it, you cancel it, and you forget about it. So first, name the debt. What did they take from you or what do they owe you? A happier childhood? A better marriage? Respect? Second, cancel the debt. The deeper the offense, the more concrete you need to make this. For a minor issue, you can talk to an empty chair. If it's more serious, you write a letter or you actually make up an invoice which you tear up or you burn. This makes it real for us. And finally, forget the debt. When you hold on to an offense, it takes up space in your heart. When you evict an offense, invite the Lord into that place of your heart instead to heal your heart, to bring you back to where you were before the offense. You have every right in the world to be offended. Fight that natural instinct and name it, forgive it, and forget it. It's not like you're freeing the offender, you're actually freeing yourself.